Yay. How about we get this out of here real quick? Sweet. Yeah, do you want to sign in for me? Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay, yeah, so we're just about going to get started now. Uh, I think everyone settled in. There's a sign-in link. Please sign in. Someone told me it's helpful, so you should probably do it. Okay, I'm going to move on now. Oh, refresh dog. Um, don't refresh. Yeah, dog. Don't refresh. <laughs> I'm going to refresh right now. Can I, re can I refresh now, Brian? Um, I, I, I literally see it. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. We can just look at it while we do that. It'll be really fun. There you go. All right, wonderful. Okay, whatever. Uh, Jesus. Okay, I got this. Okay, so just real quick. Um, I know I usually email you guys the credentials. Um, Google changed their API. So uh, the script I use doesn't work anymore. Thank you, Google. Um, so yeah, essentially your login credentials now are in a Google Sheet that's on our link tree. Also, um, we'll be, we will be using the SEC slash vSphere today. So there is a new uh, VPN profile that is also on the link tree. So today's a really good day to remember the link tree. And if you have any questions about today's workshop, the answer is probably in the link tree. So yeah, I just want to specify that. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're here now where the arrow is crazy. Oh, I didn't know we had those. Oh, that's okay. I do. Yeah, so we have some quick announcements before we get started. So first thing I want to mention is that eBoard applications are now open. Um, we are trying to change a few things with how the eBoard is structured. So there are some new positions. There might be other positions that are not um, currently in the, the next eBoard. But if you are really passionate about cyber and really want to help make a difference, then, you know, the Swift eBoard is a really great place to learn and uh, contribute back to the community. There are two QR codes that are on top. Um, one of them is for the applications, which uh, is the Google form. You just fill it out, um, have your resume there too. If you want to learn more about the positions, then there's also um, that QR code, which uh, provides a description of each of the positions that we are having for next year. Um, so if you are interested in becoming eBoard, then uh, please consider applying. Is it on the link tree? Okay. What's up, Simon? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> just apply. Yeah, but once again, um, we'll put these on the link tree later, but uh, if you want to apply or if you want to learn more about the process, then uh, use these links. So any questions? All right, cool. And I think um, the deadline to submit these is going to be the 31st, um, but we'll do like rolling interviews as soon as you apply. So we'll just be watching the, um, the form to see if we have any um, responses. And that's it. I'll pass it on to Vinny and Dylan. Thank you very much, Taylor. All right. So I'm Dylan and I are here to talk about another really cool, really cool competition you guys can join. It's called ITC, otherwise known as Information Technology Competition. Basically what it is, it is a three-week case competition, and there are five different categories you guys can participate in. Uh, and in this competition, teams of, uh, teams of students from various schools, so not just our school, other schools as well, uh, have the opportunity to demonstrate their IT knowledge and skills and apply those skills to real life case studies. Basically, there's gonna be a panel of judges. You're gonna be talking to that panel uh, with a hopefully a presentation about fixing a problem that they give you. Now let's talk about the case categories. As you can see, there are five categories here. We have IT strategy, IT security, 
data analytics, web app development, and digital forensics. And under each category, we're, we have some things that possibly could be in there. As you can see, IT strategy has industry analysis, SWOT analysis, which is strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats, as well as some other things. And data analytics has patterns with data regression, a lot of cool things you can join. Just if you're more interested, feel free to DM any of us. We'll explore, we'll be able to explain more things. And finally, I'll be handing out to Mr. Dylan Todd. Really appreciate it, Mr. Vincent Pastrami. So, so here's the ITC timeline. So it starts on March 25th, 2023. So you'll be given two weeks to prepare uh, to work on your deliverables. And then April 8th, 2023 is when you have one week to prepare the presentation where you will be presenting on April 15th to different stakeholders and judges that are actually working members in the field. So they'll be open to hiring if you do well. So it's going to be from 8 a.m. to 8, 5 p.m. That's the day of the competition. And yeah, um, here are the team requirements. So you need a team of at least three to five participants. And there is max one graduate student per team. Um, next is part-time student must be taking minimum of six units. So most of you guys, I'm assuming, are at least part-time students. And there's a $100 entry fee per team. So the more participants there are on the team, the less you have to pay individually. For example, my team with Jason, Vinny, um, Nathan, and someone named AJ, we only have to pay $20 each because we have five people on the team. And yeah. Um, recommend resumes for all team members at time of registration. This is because we want to be able to give your resumes to the employers that will be looking to hire as I said before. And yeah, um, by one point I'm contact for money and administration and also no late submissions. So please connect with us. The last day of signing up is tomorrow night at 11.59 p.m. So try to find your teams. There's lots of people out here. I know don't have a team yet, so you can form something here and sign up. Um, here's a link tree. You will see the ITC signups. So if there are any more questions, you can ask me or Mr. Vincent Pastrami. And yeah, I'll be passing it back to Mr. Dylan Chan. So I spent the Discord like two or three times today um, saying, hey, RSVP. Is there anyone that didn't RSVP? Everyone here RSVP'd? You're all beautiful. Okay, Did it, and Zoom, if you didn't RSVP, uh, just uh, message me and I'll add your name to the, um, to the Google Sheet. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah, ITC, very cool competition. I've heard a lot of great things about it. Uh, and I know people who've gotten a lot out of it. So I strongly recommend everybody here compete. Uh, as a disclaimer, though, I personally haven't. I don't think I'm allowed to this year anyways. But uh, moving on. So we're going to cover a few things before we get into the workshop, since there's some stuff and that I didn't really finish covering on uh, Tuesdays. So getting situated. So the actual sort of like topology that we're dealing with here, you'll you actually only have access to two of these hosts. Basically, there was a workstation host with the IP address 12.12.150, and it is the compromise host. It has already been dealt with, so it's kind of like cut off from the network and powered down, but we still have access to the log, so we can try to figure out, you know, what exactly went wrong and how it got popped, which is the goal for today. What you will have access to is the WASA host. Uh, that one has the IP address total 12.100. You will have console access to this one. You will ha you have the both user and root credentials for this machine. Uh, I'll explain why in a bit. And the actual uh, credentials used to log into the WASA dashboard, which is available on localhost 80 or basically in HTTP localhost 80 on, the, on that box. The credentials are there too. And then we have CTFD. So what uh, CTFD is going to provide you the prompts and the things to look out for. Then once you find them you uh, from the WASA dashboard by looking through all of the events that it logged, you will submit the flags and see if you, know, you found the right uh, artifact left on the system. For CTFD, you will have to register. Uh, you can only access that IP address if you're on the VPN, which we will give you the link to in the next slide. But when you register, you don't really need to care about what email you're registering with. All you need 
it's just a requirement by the actual application. Don't too, put too much thought into that. For actually getting uh, connected to the environment, there is a link, DHGD, uh, Waza, bruh, uh, yeah. So that is going to give you the link to get the VPN profile. We In the screenshot, I'm using PryTunnel to connect to the VPN, but if you have other clients, such as the OpenVPN client, that should work too. To my awareness, the pin code should be six zeros or no pin code at all, if I'm not mistaken. Gotcha, yeah. There's like no username, never seems to be. That once you are able to connect to the VPN, you should be able to access vSphere, which is accessible at elsa.scc.cpp. The credentials that you will use to log in there are on the Excel sheet that Bryant was referring to earlier. That's available on the link tree because the email script kind of exploded. So I'm gonna leave this up here for a bit so you guys have time to download all the required materials. All right, I feel like that's enough time. Uh, these slides should be available on the link tree, if I'm not mistaken. So if you need to pick up something that I went by, you can just access that and go where you need to be. And when you actually ask, log into vSphere, I'm going to need you guys to run this command once you log into your host because the cloning went weird. And $5 to anyone who can figure out this reference. It's completely arbitrary. But yeah, ju just going to need you to run this command. Uh, it, you, this is why you have root credentials, so you can actually run this command once you actually get your console access on the machine. For accessing CTFD, the URL is there once again. You can register with any email. It doesn't matter. It doesn't check, and it's not important at all whatsoever. And the actual flag submissions do not require any wrapper at all. Just simply submit what you think the answer is, and it'll either be correct or not. You have infinite tries. It doesn't matter. Just you know, keep throwing everything until you find it, essentially. So going into Waza, I'm going to cover a few things that I wasn't able to on Tuesday, namely navigation. So once you guys have console access to your machines, you're going to need to navigate to the actual part of the dashboard that will allow you to view the logs. This can be done by going from the home page to the by to clicking the active agents button or the number there. From there, you will have the option to select multiple agents. We're going to select the one for the desktop machine. And then from there, you're going to go to the security event so then we can view the logs on it. Once again, these slides should be available on the link tree. So if you're lost or I'm moving by too fast, you can just open them and catch up. Once you're actually viewing the dashboard or I mean the logs, there's a lot of things going on up top. Uh, let me get my laser pointer thing. Up here is where you can make queries within the search bar. There's a specific syntax that we'll, we will be going over in a bit. Down here, you can add filters. So then you can filter out a specific amount of events based on conditions. The conditions are very simple and easy to work with. You'll have your event fields on the left over here, which is how events are, or events are identified. They will be comprised of multiple fields that you can use to sort of start begin filtering and do your whole searches. And then over here, we have a timeline. That's not too important, but if you're actually dealing with logs that have occurred over a large period of time, this is where you could sort of start nailing things down. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'll go, okay. The creds for the box and not VSphere, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The creds for the box are available over here. The user has the password, bruh. It does not have pseudo access 
but the root password also same thing very lazy it's easy to type and remember once you log into the box make sure as root to run this command so your dashboard isn't broken okay yeah so once after that we have filters these this is once again located right here around the top left of the menu with all the logs and to work with filters very simple you can select from select a specific field um, once again the fields are over here on the left and then you can tell it to match an operator whether a, the field is a specific value or if this uh, field exists etc and then once you put that it's going to filter out all the events and only leave the ones that match the filter that you put so then your queries will have a smaller amount of logs to search through for actually building your queries there are multiple components this is just an example query on this agent should be lowercase so the orange is going to be the field name the field names are case sensitive and then you put a colon and then the value of that field on the right. So then this allows you to look through events that have a specific field with a specific value. If you want to combine extra components in your queries, then you can include Boolean operators such as and or this greater sign. And if you also want to look through specific timestamps, then you can include this keyword for that time stuff and then match a operator with a date value. When you search for values, uh, you, like I said, the syntax is going to be field colon value. But let's just say there's not a specific field you're looking for, and maybe you just want to get specific information. You can just put any string case insensitive into the search bar or included within a, a Boolean operator. And it will look through all the events to see which ones have that string in it or depending on whatever your query is. So for example, this query down here, 12, 12, 12, 150 and administrator will return all events that contain the 12, 12, 12, 150 string and the administrator string, whether they be in like somewhere in the event or in one of its fields, uh, as long as they show up somewhere within the event, it will return that event for you to look at. And then we have Boolean conditions. We have, oh, what, okay. we have and, or, not, and the parentheses aren't necessarily Boolean conditions. I kind of just labeled there. They're for grouping. These should be a bit self-explanatory and means both uh, the conditions that you put on the left and right have to match up or means only one has to match up for the event to show up in the search. Not means that event must not contain whatever condition you're putting and parentheses allow you to sort of group things like how you would in math. So in this case, expanding upon the query we had earlier, 12, 12, 12, 150 and administrator or net user and not guest. This means that the event is either going to have 12, 12, 12, 150 and administrator, those strings within the event, or it's going to have the string net user, but not have guest. It's a bit like layered and unnecessarily complicated. It's, pro it's a poor query, but it's just an example how, of how you can combine these to make more effective queries. Because when you make your queries, you don't want to get, you're going to be dealing with a lot of logs. So when you make your query, you want to get the least amount of logs possible that contain the most relevant amount of information. So if your query is going to return a million logs, there wasn't really any point to be making it. So you want to make sure your queries are as specific, but at the same time, as flexible as possible. Once you update your queries, you can hit the update button on the right and then refresh. So the search will refilter and redisplay all the events in accordance to that query. If you want to know more, you can refer to this link down here for documentation on the actual query language that the WASA search engine uses. I believe it's called something along the lines of DQL or dashboard query language. It is kind of simple, but you can build off of a lot of it. So some other tips and tricks, 
the queries, as I was saying, they are case insensitive, but the event ID, uh, the event fields are case sensitive. And wildcards could be helpful if you're trying to look for a specific value, but you don't necessarily know what every, the or if you're looking for a specific event field, but you don't know what the values are going to be, or maybe what specific parts can be due to that, the possibility of them being multiple values. So you can include wildcards within your query to deal with those sort of cases. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, go have fun with the lab now or the workshop.